Let's open our Bibles to the book of Haggai, right? Isn't that what it is, Haggai? You understand what it, that means now? For those that are with us for the first time, I gave this group a picture to remember the contents of the book of Haggai. So we've got this, this prophet hugging this big eye. So you see that he's hugging an eye, Haggai. And the temple's in the background. The book of Haggai is about the temple of God and what the people were not doing that they should have been doing. And God was trying to correct their errant ways. And they are responding in this. <clears throat> And you've seen this on multiple of your handouts. By the way, if you need a handout, raise your hand. We have one down here, one over. Okay. You keep your hand up, and the ushers will bring them to you. All right, you've seen this, this picture, or this uh, table up here. And as I was looking at the table this week, I noticed an error on it. So I need you to correct it on this handout. But then if you still have the other handouts, go back to each handout, make the correction over and over again because it's going to appear on all of them. And it's right here in the box at the bottom that 29 years should be 19 years. It is a bad case of math, okay? You, you subtract the numbers, and it's 19, not 29. And I, on this handout, I added a few more numbers in where you see that the 19 comes from. <clears throat> Haggai was a prophet of God with a message from the Lord for the people of living in Judah and Jerusalem that have come back from Babylonian captivity during the days of the Persian Empire. Tonight's it is the last of his four prophecies. The message was given on December the 18th in 520, so the, the blank there, or the box there, this empty, on the left column of your table, December 18th, 520 B.C. is the fill-in for that. <clears throat> this means that Haggai's entire speaking and prophesying ministry occurred in a four-month period of time. Unlike other prophets, like Jeremiah, who prophesied for decades, and Isaiah for decades, this guy prophesied for four months and God, that's, that's all God gave him. That's what God was wanting to accomplish through him. And God used it. He used two prophets to motivate the people to get busy and build his temple. So the people returned from Babylonian captivity during the days of the Persian Empire. Cyrus, the first Persian king, allowed the Jews to go back home, sent back the vessels, some of them, that was stolen by Nebuchadnezzar out of the temple of God before he destroyed the temple of God. And Cyrus gave some of those vessels back and sent the Jews back with some money with the um, direction to rebuild the temple and reestablish the people there. And, and the people uh, built the altar of burnt offering, started offering sacrifices. They laid the foundation of the temple kind of marked it out on the ground, maybe lay the first row of bricks or blocks, stones around. And because there was so much opposition from the people in the land, they got discouraged and quit. And they quit for 16 years and got busy building their houses and improving their houses and building luxury in their houses and building businesses and planting crops. And they were looking after their affairs. Not bad things. They weren't bad things. But they were doing more for themselves to the ignoring of God's house and building God's temple and that's what the Lord didn't appreciate so Haggai started preaching messages the people got busy and started building from his first message until they started laying stone again was 23 days we know that because he gives us the dates when he preached and the dates when they started building so 23 days later they started the construction project and the book of, of Ezra tells us that Haggai and Zechariah the two prophets along with Zerubbabel and uh, Jeshua, which was the political leader, the, the governor, and the high priest, and the people. They all got busy together, and so you've got these two prophets right, into the, right in the thick of the construction, 
building. They're getting dirty. They're getting cut probably, bruised, the things that go along with building, fashioning stone and lifting heavy stones and putting them in place and some carpentry work. They're a part of it all. They're participating, laboring, and the fill-in is watching. They're watching the people work as they're working with the people. They're observing. They're listening. And God gives Haggai four messages for these people. The first one comes before they were, they were building. And I gave a summary here on your handout of these prophecies. Prophecy number one, which we looked at our second week together. God was ranked too low in the people's lives, so his blessings were withheld. And God tells us what that withholding was. And it was hurtful to the people. And when it was pointed out that, the, that the, the, their sins, the lack of what they should have been doing, was because the temple was being built, they got busy right away and started building the temple. That's in prophecy one. Prophecy two, God encouraged the people in the construction project because Haggai is right in the trenches with them, listening to them and watching and participating. He could see where the people were at. They needed encouragement. And prophecy two was an encouragement to the people. See, the people saw the temple that, that they were working on and the ones that saw Solomon's temple, which would have been the old men, when they saw what they were building, they couldn't help but to compare it to Solomon's temple, which was a beauty to behold. And after seeing Solomon's and then seeing this, what they were building, it was in their eyes as nothing. And God encouraged them that it's not about buildings. It's about relationship. God wanted the relationship with the people. And now that they're building again and their, their hearts are in tune with God, God is appreciating the relationship that he's having with the people. So it's not the material things that concern God. That was just what you could see that was indicative of what was wrong in their heart. And when they got their heart right, then God started blessing. Prophecy 3, the people's obedience moved God to bless them. And God then pointed out that what was happening for the last 16 years that was withheld blessing was because they were not building the temple. Now that they're building, everything's different. And, and God instructs them that from this day forth, he's going to bless them. And look with me in chapter 2, verse 18. Now this is at the end of his third prophecy. Consider now from this day upward, all right, from now going forward, consider this. From the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. Why haven't they brought forth? Because the people haven't been doing the work of God. God's not blessing them. So the fruit trees are not bearing. Is the seed yet in the barn? And the answer is not given, but the answer is no. And what he's speaking of is, the, is what's called uh, uh, seed corn. It's what you don't plant in the harvest. Because if you have a failed harvest, you need to have something left back that you can plant again to try to have a harvest. So you always hold out a little bit of seed corn and, the corn, and at the end of the, the growing season you have seed corn in your barn and when the growing season starts the next year you pull that out and you sow it but you don't sow 100% of it you need to hold back a little bit just in case you have crop failure. So you have something to recover with, right? Is the seed yet in the barn? And he says, no, it's not. You have, you have planted everything. You have planted all your seed corn, every, all your surplus. Everything's gone. It's gone. And the fruit trees aren't bearing because the people haven't had their heart right with God. But they now have their heart right with God. So this prophecy ends with this in verse 19. From this day will I bless you. In verse 18, he says, consider now from this day upward or onward. From, and he gives the date. And then he says, at the end of the prophecy, from this day, I'm going to bless you. You're now doing right. And the blessings that I've withheld for 16 years, they're going to flow. 
I'm going to bless you as a people and the work of your hands. And now, the last prophecy, number four. <clears throat> it's directed to the political leader. The political is the answer. It's directed to the political leader of the people. That is Zerubbabel. It's a message of encouragement and a message of intention, what God is going to do. It's as though he wants to encourage Zerubbabel that this beginning seems insignificant. It seems small. You're, you're just now a, a poor, trying to recover nation on the corner of the Persian Empire. And all the wealth of Persia is way over there in Babylon and Susa, the capitals. And it looks like there's not much happening over here. But that's not the way it really is because I am with you. And something great is going to happen over here. He's going to encourage Zerubbabel. What can God do? That's what I entitled this. What can God do? Now look with me in chapter 2, verse 20, prophecy number 4, and here's what it says. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, now, I want you to notice the I wills in this passage. Speak unto Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, Saying, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Six I wills what God can do. Can you get that for me? Six I wills of what God can do. Now I want to do something, thank you. I want to do something that I've not done before in teaching. I'm going to read two chapters to you. That sounds like a, a lot, but it's it's a, uh, it's a good story, and it fits perfect with what's happening here. It's the historical background for this. So I want you to follow with me in Ezra chapter 5, and I'm going to read through this quickly and make some commentary because this is the setting for the book of Haggai. This is the setting. This is what's happening historically. Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem and with them were the prophets of God helping them. That is, Haggai and Zechariah were helping the governor and helping the high priest, Jeshua. Verse 3, at the same time came to them Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shetharbaznai and their companions, and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Now listen, folks. Anytime you try to do something for God, there's going to be somebody in opposition to it. You try to do something good and somebody is going to be standing there crying foul because you're doing something for God. And it's always been that way. It will always be that way. And that's exactly what's happening here. As soon as they started building, people came along and Tatnai and Shethar Bosnai and their companions and they're asking, who, who commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Verse 4, then said we, we, Tadnai and Shethar Bosnai, we said unto after them after this manner, what are the names of the men that make up this building? So the questions are two. Who gave you permission to do this, and what are their names? Verse 6. Verse, uh, verse 5, but the eye... But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they 
could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter I'm going to stop here and I want to give you this you got this the first time we met together as, as, and this is, a, this is a resource tool so when you're reading these books of the Bible and you find these Persian people this chart will tell you who they are this, these are all of the kings of the, Pers the Achaemenid Persian Empire and every one of these people that has a little Bible by their name these people are found in the scriptures the others were historical figures but they're not mentioned in the scriptures and we're talking now about the time when Darius the first that's this guy right here he is now the king and that's who Tetani is going to write so verse 6 the copy of the letter that Tetani the governor on this side of the river and Shethar Bosnai and his companions the Afarsakites Afarsakites which were on this side of the river sent unto Darius the king they sent a letter unto him wherein was written thus now here's Tatnai's letter to King Darius the Persian king unto Darius the king all peace be it known unto the king that we went into the province of Judea to the house of the great God now I showed you this map this is the the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea but it's the western side of the Persian Empire that butts right up to the Mediterranean Sea and this province or satrapy is called the one beyond the river and it's also called in the southern part the province of Judea this verse in the Bible that mentions Judea that is the only place in the Bible that the word Judea is found and Judea is the Aramaic form of the word Judah which is found a lot in the Bible but here it's mentioned in this Aramaic form be it known unto the king that, that we went unto the province of Judea to the house of the great God which is builded with great stones and timber is laid in the walls and this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands then asked we those elders and said unto them thus who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls we asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of, of them and thus they returned us answer saying now this is Tatnai writing to Darius giving Darius the words that the Jewish elders gave Tatnai in answer to their questions and thus they return answers uh, saying we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth now let me say this before we go on you know they could have said this who gave you permission to do this Cyrus that's the answer isn't it isn't Cyrus the one that gave him permission to go back and build absolutely they could have said Cyrus they didn't say Cyrus they use this an opportunity to talk about God and that's why they said we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth now can I throw this out as a thought to you when, when people ask you questions if you can bring God into it bring God into it you know I think of when, uh, when Pharaoh asked Joseph how old are you he could have said whatever is it 147 he could have just given a number but he started talking about the years of my life in sojourn on earth have been a blessing and it was it was an answer that was spiritual not just a quick 147 who told you you could come back here and build Cyrus but this was an opportunity to say we're the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was built these many years ago which the great king of Israel built and set up that was Solomon but after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven under wrath he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon the Chaldean who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon and can I say folks that when you sin as a, as a dad when you sin as, as a mom 
and I should be saying this to younger families, but they're not in here. But when you do that, moms and dads, you hurt your kids. Your kids will bear the brunt of the punishment that God will send your way. Now, God doesn't punish your kids for your sin, but when he punishes you, boy, they are the collateral damage that, that gets hit as God makes life hard on you. It makes life hard on your kids. But the, in verse 13, but in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king made a decree to build this house of God. All right, there's the answer to question number one. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, he brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And that's the same person as Zerubbabel. And, saith, and said unto him, Take these vessels, go, carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be builded in his place. Then came the same Sheshbazar and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even until now, now, hath it been in building, and yet it is not finished. And it's not finished because for 16 years it sat dormant because they quit building. Verse 17, now therefore, if it seem good to the king, now this is Tatnai now, he's finished quoting what the Jews have said to him, now Tadnai is, is, is given some uh, a, a request to Darius. Now therefore, if it seem good uh, to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. So, Tadnai's requested that a search be made to trying to verify did Cyrus really send them the, the, back to build the house what Tat and I didn't do is raise an army and stop the building so I, I don't know what all to read into that but he is not stopping the building he's wondering if they have permission to build so he's trying to find out is what they're doing is that a right thing chapter 6 verse 1 then Darius the king made a decree and search was made in the house of the rolls, that would be the royal archives, where all the legal documents are, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon, and there was found in Ekmetha. Now let me show you another map here. Here, here is where the temple is being built. This is Jerusalem. So Tadnai sends a letter back to Susa, to Darius and wants him to search the royal archives in Babylon to see was this decree really passed by Cyrus and they searched and they didn't find it but they did find in Akmetha Ak which is Akbatana right there they found it in the royal ar archives there it wasn't in Babylon it was in Akbatana or it's the term in, in the King James is Akmetha. Now here's a, here's a map of the Persian Empire. And I gave you some of these early on just so you understand the history of this, what developed. You've got Persis right here on the east side of the Persian Gulf. It's called Persian Gulf today. And the capital of Persia was Pasargade. Cyrus became the, the, the leader of Persis and he started to build an empire and he started conquering so he comes up to Elam and he conquers the Amalekites the Amalekites capital was Susa so once he conquered the Amalekites Susa became a capital to him too now he's got two he kept marching he went up to Media and when he got there he conquered the Median kingdom and Akbatana was the capital of the Median kingdom and then he went on up to Uartu and then he went over to Lydia and once he owned all of this territory and controlled it he turned his eyes to the crown jewel of the Middle East which was the Babylonian Empire and then he marched south he marched from the west he marched from the east to the extreme east he marched on Babylonia and he defeated the Babylonian Empire in 539 the night that Belshazzar, Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall the Persians came in and defeated the Babylonians 
And Daniel at that time lived in Babylon. And so now Babylon was a capital. Those are the five capitals of the Persian Empire. Search was made in Babylon, nothing there. Search was made in Akbatana, uh, we found it. I guess if they hadn't found it there, they would probably go on to Susa. Oh, and there's one other capital, I guess I should say. That's the five. Pers Persepolis wasn't even built at this time, but um, Darius started building it. But they searched and they found it. That's in verse 2. This was in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof, three score cubits, etc. Uh, verse 4, with three rows of great stones, a little bit more. Uh, oh, let the expenses be given out of the king's house. So Cyrus is going to be paying for a lot of this. And also let the gold and, and silver vessels uh, of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple. Okay, they're going back. Verse 6, now therefore, Tadnai, governor beyond the river, Shethar Bosnai, and your companions, the Pharsavites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. Okay, what's that mean? I mean, stay away. Here's instruction one. Stay away. Keep out of their way. They're building. Be the far thence. Let the work of this house alone. Don't bother them. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders and the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree. Now Darius is making a decree. What shall ye do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered. All right, get out of the way, leave them alone, pay for it. <laughs> Give them money. And that which they have need of. What do they have need of? Young bullocks and rams and lambs for burnt offerings unto the God of heaven. Wheat, salt, salt. Why do they need Salt. Did you know salt was as valuable as money in, in these ancient empires? It was as valuable as money, and oftentimes people were paid in salt instead of paid in currency. Soldiers were paid in salt often. In fact, the word salary means salt money because how the people were paid. So give them salt and wine and oil according to the appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem let it be given to them day by day without fail that they may offer sacrifices and sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons and that's why he wants to leave them alone build a house those people will pray for me here's a king a heathen king he wants some prayer also verse 11 I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up let him be hanged thereon if you try to twist this decree and you try to alter this decree then here's another decree your house is going to be torn down with the timber there's going to be gallows made and you're going to be hung you're going to be hanged thereon and his house shall be made a dunghill for this all right got that this is uh he's serious about this tear down the house use the timber build gallows hang the person and then make make the house pl the plot of land the public sewer spot where everybody dumps their sewage that's if you mess with the decree verse 12 and the God that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people and shall put to their hand an altar to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. What do you think Tatnai did? Verse 13, Tatnai the governor on this side of the river and Shethar Bosnai and the companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. They did it speedily. And the elders of the Jews built it and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes the king of Persia. What? Artaxerxes? 
Why does he say Artaxerxes? That's when you pull out your Persian map chart and you look at it. Here's what you find out. Artaxerxes wasn't even born when this all happened. He doesn't come along for 71 years. Why, why is Artaxerxes in there? Well, let's go to Ezra chapter 7 and look in verse 11. The temple was, was completed in 515. Artaxerxes, he comes to the throne in 464, 71 years after the temple was finished. But it says in chapter 7 and verse 11 of Ezra, now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra, the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. So he's making a decree to the Jews, the ones that didn't go back with Zerubbabel, or to Xerxes, decades later, says to the Jews that stayed behind, go, any one of, any of you that want to go, go with Ezra uh, up, to, up to the house of God, up to your land. And he gives offerings and Instructions what to do with the offerings. And look in verse 27. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing into the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem. So here's his decree. His decree is take this money, go back, all of you, go back and worship God and take this and beautify the temple. It's already been built and it's been built for decades. But take this money and beautify it. Make it nicer. What can God do? <laughs> what can God do? What does he have the ability to do in this world? What does God have the ability to do in our nation? What does he have the ability to do in your family, in your life, in your business, with your child, with your grandchildren. You add your struggle in there, whatever the struggle is, and ask yourself this question, what does God have the ability to do regarding this? Well, I'll tell you this, God can use even the most unaccountable of rulers. Rulers is the fill in on your blank. The most unaccountable. A Persian king, like a Babylonian king, like an Assyrian king, they, their word was law. Nobody could challenge them. Nobody in their realm could challenge them and get away with it. All they had to say is, kill him! And that person was executed. He didn't have to justify what he said. He didn't have to answer to anybody. If he said it, that's what was done. And if the people didn't execute his command, others would execute the people that didn't execute his command. His word was law. God can use even the most unaccountable rulers, even Middle East tyrants. Now I'll say this, we're in a difficult season right now in America, and you all know it. We have an election coming, and it is uncertain what's going to happen. That is uncertain to us. It is not uncertain to God. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And God can even use difficult rulers. And if if a Republican gets in, God can use him. And if a Democrat gets in, God can use her. God, it doesn't matter who's in the office as far as God's power. God can control and do what he wants to do through, the, he can even use unruly, difficult people. And Artaxerxes is a perfect example of this. He was a man that was a Middle East tyrant, in his family, he had son number one, who he named Xerxes II. Xerxes I was Esther's husband. That's in your chart. He named his son uh, Xerxes II, and Xerxes II was killed by son number two, Sogdianus. That was our Xerxes' son by a concubine, which was basically a lady that was a 
sexual companion to the king if he wanted that. Son number two, Sogdianus, he was killed by an illegitimate son number three, Achis. That was Artaxerxes' son by another concubine. And then son number three, Achis, changed his name to Darius. That's the Darius that's a part of this the story here. He is, well, he's at the end of the story. He's the last of the, he's the last Darius king mentioned in the Bible. And that's in Nehemiah chapter 12. So to say the least, Artaxerxes and his family had issues. Bad people, heathen people, and yet God was able to use him. And I'm going to read to you just some bullet points of the decree that Artaxerxes made. Okay, can remember, now when I read this, this is a heathen king. This is a bad guy. This is, the, this is a tyrant, and God's going to use him. And here's his decree. The Jews are free to go back with Ezra. I, Artaxerxes, am financing the beautification of the temple. He said specifically, quote, all the silver and the gold that can you find in the, all the province of Babylon for the house of their God, which is at Jerusalem. Ezra, you can take all the gold and silver you can find in Babylon. Take it back to the temple to beautify it. People are free to contribute to the refurbishing of the temple, probably diverting tax dollars is what that means. Use the surplus money at your own discretion, Ezra. Deliver the temple vessels back to Jerusalem. The ones that weren't sent back by Cyrus are Xerxes sending the rest of them back so they can be used in temple worship. If you need anything else, I will pay for it out of the Persian treasury. Artaxerxes' treasures west of the Euphrates River were to supply Ezra with whatever he needed. Just tell them your needs. They will supply. Whatever else God commands that we haven't thought about, let it be done. Now he's covering all the bases, et cetera, et cetera. If there's anything we haven't covered, let it be done if that's what Ezra thinks that God needs. Temple personnel, they are exempt from taxes. And this is the one that really gets me. Ezra was decreed by Artaxerxes to appoint magistrates and judges and teach them God's law. Teach them the Pentateuch, God's law, and the king's law. And if people will not obey God's law, then they are going to be punished by death or by banishment or by confiscation of goods or by imprisonment. Okay, you got that? That's, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. But the king decreed a law that Ezra was to appoint judges and they were to teach God's law. And if God's people wouldn't obey God, Artaxerxes, I'll either kill you, or I'll imprison you, or I'll banish you, or I'm going to punish you if you don't obey your God. That is God using a heathen king to try to motivate the people to do what they're supposed to do. What can God do with a heathen ruler? You know, when uh, in 2016, when I went to the polls and I voted, I, I, I had basically two viable choices. I could vote for Donald Trump or I could vote for Hillary Clinton. And I'll tell you, the person I voted for, I held my nose when I pulled the lever. <laughs> and it was... I thought, what choice do we have? I tell you this, I was pleasantly surprised at as many good policies that came out of the Trump administration that really took me unaware. As I, just, I did not expect that. Can you imagine how surprised Ezra must have been when he gets this decree? <laughs> oh man, I'm supposed to teach people God's law and if they don't obey the law, the king's mad at them. God was... was even using a heathen king. What can God do? In your notes, anything that he wants to do. That's what he can do. Anything that he wants to do. He has the power to, to manipulate, to direct, to punish even heathen kings to, to accomplish his will. This is the same Artaxerxes that Nehemiah was the cupbearer to. Artaxerxes the first. The cupbearer was the guy that that tasted the king's food and drank, and the drank specifically to make sure it wasn't poisonous, 
because, because a tyrant is always trying to be knocked off by somebody. And so the Persian king had a cupbearer that would check the food out. And so he's, he's the king's most trusted confidant. And Nehemiah wants to leave Artaxerxes and go back to Jerusalem and build the walls and the gates and the city. Do you think he's going to let his most trusted person go in the empire, his own personal cupbearer? He let him go for 12 years. Nehemiah's gone. Now that defies logic. What can God do? God can even make a heathen king think illogically and do what God wants done. Well, now we get to Haggai's last prophecy. It was, he was directing his attention on the political leader of the reestablished Jewish nation, and here's the final prophecy. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. That's probably going to happen at the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. That's probably what's referenced here. Verse 22, I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'll destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen. I'll overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. So these people are going to fight each other. They're on the battlefield, and in the confusion of the battle, they turn on each other, and they're killing one another. They're killing people on their own side because of the confusion. And that happened in the Bible, right, with, with Gideon and fighting the, the Amalekites. And in the confusion of the battle, they started slaying one another. And they're just sitting, 300, just watching it, just watching the fight go on and as the enemy slew themselves. And we know from Ezekiel 38 that in the battle of Gog and Magog, the, the battle, the confusion will come from the Lord and they will fight each other in the battle of Gog and Magog. One. In the battle of Armageddon, Zechariah 14, there's confusion on the battlefield and friendly nations fight each other instead of fighting the belligerent nations. What can God do? What will he do? In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, this is verse 23, I'll take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel is it God's signet. Now, if this works, I want to show you about a, a minute clip from Ben Hur and this idea of a signet ring. I don't know if we can pull this off or not. A video clip. For the Tribune, the compliments of Quintus Adius. He awaits your pleasure. Consul here? It is Quintus Adius, the younger Tribune. Find him. Bring him to me. I didn't know the consul had a son. Fair of young Arius. He's a champion of the great circus. Why is he here presenting me with gifts? Perhaps he will race against you in the games. Look. That's magnificent. And from a man I've never met. You're wrong, Marcella. Marcellus thought Ben Hur was dead. And how can he be how can he be a Roman of distinction? And Ben-Hur comes up, tells how he saved this guy's life, and he elevated him Judah. In, the Persian, in the Roman Empire. And he picks up a tablet, and he says, do you know his seal? And he hits it like that real hard with his ring to put an imprint on the, the document he had. And they saw the imprint of the signet ring. The signet ring, worn by somebody, carried the authority of the king or the person who that represented. Zerubbabel is the signet that he, he is the guy in the kingly line of the Jewish kings. His grandfather was Jehoiachin who was taken into captivity and lived his days out in Roman captivity in Babylonian captivity and Zerubbabel born and raised in captivity in Babylon he's the grandson of the next to the last Jewish king and Zerubbabel comes back and God says you're my signet 
In other words, I'm reestablishing the kingly line. It's the line of David. I'm going to reestablish the kingly line of David. And I, you're going to be the signet. I have chosen you, saith the Lord. And the ultimate fulfillment of that final verse is going to happen in the millennial kingdom when Jesus sits on the, 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 the Davidic throne as a son of David who came through David's line and Zerubbabel is in that line God is going to reestablish that kingly line and Zerubbabel was, was a link in the chain of this what can God do about anything he wants to do he is powerful. So, in your notes, he can make the details of his word come to pass. Yep. He can use the events of history to accomplish his word. In fact, Jesus said, I, I've come not to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. I, I can make it happen. God is powerful to do that. So, here's some takeaways for us. Be awed at the marvelous power of God. Be awed at that. God can. Don't, don't say, can God? Say, God can. He can do anything. Number two, view the events of your life through the eyes of faith. God will do you good as you faithfully follow him. This does not mean a trial-free life, but rather a God-used life. View your life through eyes of faith. Why are you here? Why did God bring you to Valley Forge Baptist Temple? Why do you live in Pennsylvania? Why did God give you the job he's given you? Why do you have the talents he's given you? Why do you have the spiritual gifts he's given? What has he done in your life? Why has he done that? View your, the events of your life through eyes of faith. And three, be intrigued by what God is doing in your life and praise him. Be intrigued and just praise him. Let's, let's sit on the edge of our seat with God. He is actively involved in your life, whether you realize it or not. And life is a whole lot more fun if you just live by faith, knowing and believing that God is active in your life, and you never know when he's prompting you to do something, what's going to happen with that. Just take the prompting. Use your life. Let him do something with you. And about a month ago, I got a letter out of the blue from a person that I do not remember. And he, uh, he wrote a long one-page letter, single space, and he talked about being at Valley Forge Baptist Temple for a very short segment of his life. But he happened to come on a Wednesday night when... I started teaching on the book of Revelation. I did it oh, um, probably 28 years ago, on a, the first time, on a Wednesday night. And he heard, he, well, actually he came on a Sunday night, and he heard the announcement that on Wednesday night we're going to start a series on Revelation. And he always wanted to know what that book was about. He couldn't figure it out. So he came. On, on Wednesday nights never, he said I never went to church in, on a Wednesday night in my life but I came week after week and, and, I, and I learned revelation like I had not understood it before and then he wasn't here but a short period of time he left and decades rolled by and um, a lot of life went under the bridge and uh, God got a hold of his heart and he's living for God today in Florida. And he's praising God for the short window of opportunity that he had at Valley Forge Baptist Temple and what it meant to him. 